So I'm Brittany Fisher, and I'm part of the student event committee for Startup Week. And I am here to introduce two of our lovely speakers today, Danielle Dietzik and Julia Griggs, the founders of Foreplay Social, a um, dating app that is currently serving New York and Penn State. So any of the singles out there, download it. Um, these two ladies are Penn State alum with um, Danielle graduating in 2013 with a degree in education, um, as well as working for healthcare in the maternal newborn unit um, as a nurse practitioner for 10-ish years. <laughs> um, at, while Julia has a, or Julie has a master's degree in PA studies from Rutgers, and as well um, started her medical career in physician's primary care to the medically underserved um, community in um, uh, New York. And today the title of their talk is Figuring Out What You're Doing When You Have No Idea What You're Doing. So please help me welcome again, Julia Griggs and Daniel Dietzik. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Julie. I'm Danielle. Um, and as it was just mentioned, at Penn State, I was, well, I don't think it was mentioned, but I was a health policy and administration major and a bio minor, became a physician assistant, and Danielle was elementary education major, became a nurse, and then a nurse practitioner. So when we say that we had no idea what the hell we were doing, we really had no idea what the hell we were doing. And if we can do it, we're pretty confident that you all can too. So we created a 10-step guide for figuring it out. It's not necessarily in order, um, but it's things that we believe are important to, to nail. Okay, so you have an idea for a startup. Woo! Awesome. Good for you. But like, what do you do now, right? That's the position we were in. So step one is to do your research. So a really important part of doing your research is, is there an actual problem that needs to be solved, right? So you might have a really good idea for something and it might be interesting, it might be fun, but is it solving a real problem? Can you like hear me if I don't, if I just like, like the deck? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. No problem. So, so you have to make sure there's a real problem, right? And you can do that by looking on social media, you can do it by reading, you could do it by asking your friends or asking people who you think would benefit from your idea, but you have to make sure there's a real problem that you're solving. Is there a solution already? If so, those are gonna be your competitors. There might be a solution that no longer exists. You wanna figure out why doesn't it exist anymore? Where did they fail that you are going to do better, right? And then lastly, how big is your market? So if you are going to be a dating app, then your market is all singles, right? Well, not exactly, because if you are going to be a dating app with a subscription, then you wanna figure out how many singles are there that actually subscribe to dating services. And even furthermore, if you're going to be serving just the United States, then your market is going to be singles that pay for dating subscriptions in the United States. So figuring out your market. Okay, well, while we wait to progress to step two, I will just also add that having competitors is not a bad thing. And you should own the fact that you have competitors because it shows that, um, there is an opportunity in that space. And if you do have competitors and you lie about having competitors, everyone's going to know. So, that. so step two is to get market validation. So talk to everyone, especially the people that you are going to be targeting with your product or your solution, right? So for us, we spoke to all of our friends that were single, are single, use dating apps, don't use dating apps, why they don't use dating apps, would they use dating apps if they could do it with a friend. Um, so talking to everyone is important because you might think it's a good idea and your co-founder might think it's a good idea, but nobody else might think it's a good idea. Um, and on the same note of that, I think that when we first started out, 
coming from very different backgrounds. So I'll speak about being a PA, right? So I went to Rutgers with a lot of type A people. Everybody wanted to be number one in the class. Everyone wanted to get the best clinical rotations. Everyone wanted to get the best job out of uh, school. You're all in competition with each other. And there isn't that much collaborating. And so when we entered this startup world, we were really worried that everyone was going to try and steal our idea. And anytime someone wanted to introduce us to somebody, we were like, do we have them sign an NDA? Like, what do we, what do, we do? And the truth is, more or less, nobody is trying to steal your idea. That being said, you should do your research with who you're talking to because you maybe don't want to talk to somebody who is invested in one of your competitors and is kind of just talking to you to figure out what you're doing so they can go back and tell the company that they're invested in. But if you come to me and Danielle with your startup idea, I can guarantee you we have zero interest in stealing it because my blood pressure is already high enough with foreplay. So be... Um, open to talking about other people and don't be worried, but also do your homework with who you're speaking with. Um, and another way to get really great market validation is to hack things that already exist um, in your benefits. So a quick story about how we got market validation. We decided that it would be a lot more fun if single friends could date with each other as opposed to going out alone on these dating apps. So how are we going to do that, right? So what we did was we changed Danielle's dating app profile to pictures of both of us. And we wrote, swipe right if you and your awesome friend want to double date me and my awesome friend. And we changed the name to Danielle and Julie. And we watched as over 30 guys the first week wrote how great of an idea this was, that this was so much smarter. I love your enthusiastic nods, by the way. You are Danielle, and I love it. Um, <laughs> um saying how it was such a better idea that it should be its own app. And we were like, wow, people actually really want this. It's not just us. And that was a really great way for us to get validated with zero cost. Step three is know your limits. And by the way, like Julie said earlier, these don't necessarily go in chronological order. We try to pick the order that we follow the most, um, but that's not necessarily the order that you're going to follow. And as long as all of these 10 steps are complete, that's good enough. So knowing your limits means knowing what you're capable of and what your shortcomings are and understanding if it's worth it to try to grow in a certain area versus utilizing other resources, right? So for me, I can't code and neither can Julie. And we definitely want to be able to code. When you have an app and it's breaking, believe me, you just want so badly to be able to fix it yourself. But if you can't code, you have to determine whether or not it's a skill that's worthwhile or if our time is better spent growing the business and outsourcing. And that's what we decided to do. So you have to know your limits and know how much do you need to learn something um, or how much time will it take to learn something and is that worth it? And then one more thing about founders. So if you're not a solo founder, if you are co-founders like we are, then knowing your limits means knowing what you can't do that your co-founder might be able to do and vice versa. And Julie had said earlier when we were talking with other students, it's really important as a co-founder to check your ego at the door because you need to work in conjunction and the most important thing is the success of the business. And so you need to know when maybe you want to be better at something, but right now is not the time for the success of the business. Right now is not the time for me to make social media posts. <laughs> it's not the time. Um, so after you come back to reality, you can proceed to step four, which is... Step four. Is that, is that good? I'm having technical help. Oh, there we go. Okay, so step four is a huge step. Could not recommend this step enough. Use your network. So 
ask your friends and your family what they actually do. Okay. We did not know that our friends worked in marketing. (laughs) That was great. We didn't know that their husbands worked for venture capitalists. That was great. Um, We didn't know that our friends and family actually couldn't really help, but they had a good friend that could, and they can make a warm introduction for us. So actually ask your friends and family what they do. Um, Even if they're not going to directly help you, for example, our friends were not going to code our app. In hindsight, we should have asked our friends who are software engineers their opinion on the tech stack that the company we outsourced to was going to be building our app on. Had we done that, it would have saved us a lot of time and and money, um, quite frankly, because we didn't know what we didn't know. And one thing I would caution is, um, you know, if you're going to get legal advice from your uncle who is a divorce attorney, that's not the same as uh, an attorney who like deals with startups and stuff like that. So Maybe your uncle's not the best person, but maybe your uncle knows somebody else who is a good person. So definitely use your network. Um, Outside of your friends and family, I don't know if you guys are all on LinkedIn. I think I was on it as a PA in my last life, and then I rejoined it in February of 2022. But LinkedIn has been huge for my network. I didn't know so many of the jobs and roles our friends and family had that I was um, then privy to after joining LinkedIn. And if you don't have your own network, then you need to really build one. It's really important. And I did that through LinkedIn. I tried very hard to be intentional with who I connected with and why I was connecting with them. Now being on the receiving end of LinkedIn requests, if it feels impersonal or like a bot, I have zero interest in connecting. It's like, why why are we connecting, right? So being intentional with who you are reaching out to and making it personal and making the person feel like they're human and not a robot. Um, There are other ways to build your network as well, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, But using every resource that you have is huge. And you don't even know the resources that you have until you start asking. Any questions so far? Okay, awesome. So step five is know your goals and also know your life goals because the trajectory of your company is going to coincide with the trajectory of your life. So for example, you need to know what kind of exit you wanna have um, as a business owner. And when when you assess your goals, by the way, you can reassess them a hundred times, but it's just important to check in and assess your goals. So we've checked in a hundred times and changed our mind. But for, for exits, there are different types of exits, right? So there are acquisitions and there are IPOs, and this means something different for each business. So with acquisitions, you might want to just build up your company and then sell it. For IPOs, you might want to go public, but that usually means typically working for a really long time on the startup, sometimes 10 plus years. And so you want to understand what your life goals are and if you can accomplish your life goals and your startup goals so that those two are always reconciled. There is also getting investors versus bootstrapping. And something that we did early on is we bootstrapped. So we used our salaries because we were working in health to fund the business. We didn't want to take any outside money because we didn't want to give up any control over the business and because we didn't need to sell any of our company at that time. We were able to fund it ourselves, but only for so long. And then we needed to start taking investors. But once you start taking investors, expectations change. So now you have a responsibility to get them a return on their investment. And they're a little bit more involved with what's going on with the company and is the company healthy and you have to send them updates. So it's a little different than bootstrapping where you don't have to do any of that. The advice that we got early on was to bootstrap for as long as you can, because if you take on investors very, very early, you're giving them a piece of your company and it's a marriage, right? 
And we knew that we had something very special with foreplay and we knew that we had a huge, huge, huge market that we could capture. And we saw how many people were interested in our product. And so we didn't want to give up a piece of our company yet because we knew that if we did three, four years ago, it would have been a lar much larger piece that we were giving away because the value of the company wouldn't, wasn't that high. So we bootstrapped for as long as we could. It's not the most pleasant experience. It's painful. It's hard to go to work and earn money and then put it into a startup, which may or may not succeed. But if you can bootstrap for as long as you can, that was the advice that we were given. I think it was really sound and really great advice. Okay, so then step six, choose your players. So you figured out your goals, your life goals, you're feeling good, you're gonna move forward. There's a few things that you're gonna have to decide. What kind of entity your business is gonna be, right? So there are LLCs, there are C-Corps, S-Corps, and there are pros and cons to each. They all have different legal implications, all have different tax implications, and some are really appealing for investors and others aren't. So when we started out with Foreplay, we were a New Jersey LLC. Um, that was because we had zero intention of ever raising from outside investors. And because Danielle and I were still working as healthcare providers and we wanted to be totally removed and separate from our business, right? Because of liability. So we wanted total separation. When we made the decision to bring on outside investors, we knew that we were going to have to change the entity and we were going to have to become a C-Corp um, because that's what investors prefer it's easier to you know, give stock of a company. And, and for that reason, we decided to become a C-Corp. So you're gonna have to you know, figure out what kind of entity you want to be. And if you're gonna fundraise, it's gonna likely be a C-Corp. Um, but also counsel legal advice. I'm, not, I'm certainly not uh, an expert here. Um, the other thing you wanna think about are the intellectual properties that you wanna have. So the second we decided to create a business, the first thing we did was um, trademark foreplay. So foreplay is word. It's a word mark. We own the name foreplay in the dating industry. Um, it's a great piece of IP for us. We also own, you know, we have a trademark on our logo, not as important. Logos are likely going to change. Ours already has, um, but it's nothing to consider. If you're inventing something, then you're going to want to patent it, right? We didn't invent double dating, so we can't patent that. We did invent our algorithm, we could patent that, but another piece of intellectual property are trade secrets. And arguably a trade secret could be more powerful than a patent. If we put our trade secret out, I mean, if we put our algorithm out as a patent, we're basically giving a blueprint to other apps who can then see what we did and build off of that. So it's actually more valuable for us to keep that a secret. Um, so though it's not registered, it is part of our intellectual property. Anyone have questions? How come yours progress so easily when it's my turn? It's like the awkward silence. So step seven is start building. Has anyone here heard of an MVP? Cool. So it's a minimum viable product. And it's very important to get that to market as soon as possible. It doesn't need to be perfect. It doesn't need to be pretty or anywhere near perfect. But it does need to be the most basic level of your product. So there's a great quote from the co-founder of LinkedIn at the bottom here that Julie is always reminding me of when it comes to priorities with the product, which is if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. The reason why is because while you're trying to figure out the best perfect version of it, someone else could come along and make it, right? So you just want to get your product out and start getting traction. You always have to stay focused on your goal, which is... MVP, MVP, MVP. So people are always going to give feedback about an ideal version of what you're creating. And you always want to put that in like a parking lot of ideas. You don't want to necessarily act on it right now if it's not going to contribute to the MVP. We were just having a conversation um, with Lee Erickson upstairs, downstairs, I guess, about another company who is feeling stressed now because she's getting all of this user feedback about all these cool features that she should have. And she's like, I have to start building these. And the, the answer is no, you don't, right? 
like, I mean, that's great. There are premium features that we're going to have that came from our user feedback from two years ago. It's still not in the app. You have to stay focused on the MVP. I also should touch on the technical co-founder thing. So I'm not sure how many people in this room are technical or if there are others that are like me and Julie. Sometimes you want a technical co-founder so that you can have in-house tech and other times you want to outsource it. And that there are pros and cons to both. We could certainly discuss the pros and cons to both because now we've done both. But a technical co-founder, it's not, it's the title is technical co-founder, but they're not a co-founder like you and your friend are, are your co-founder. <laughs> She's my friend, but not everybody is. So they're not necessarily a founder, but their title is technical co-founder. And they don't necessarily own as much of the company as the co-founders do or as the founder does. In some cases they do, but it's not necessarily that way. I think it's important maybe to talk a little bit more about in-house versus outsourced and a technical co-founder versus not and equity and all that stuff. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So in-house means that you have a tech team in-house that is in your company that you employ. It's not a separate entity. The team is not a separate entity. The team is part of your company. So there are a lot of benefits to that. Some of those benefits are being able to contact those people at all hours of the day instead of scheduling a, a meeting, right? Um, that person is on your team. You're able to shoot them a message. So that's a huge benefit is real-time progress. Another benefit is that they have a real passion about your product because that person is dedicated to your product only or that team to your product only, as opposed to working with a, a team outside of your business, which might have other projects going on. But the reason why sometimes that's better, um, and that's where we started, was we hired an outside company. That can be less expensive. And when we first started, we really needed to cut costs everywhere. And so we outsourced to a company in India, which provided a really great MVP. It wasn't what we were going to stay with forever, but it got us the early traction. I cannot believe you just called it really great. For the first three <laughs> years, you're like, I hate this. But, see, but, you look but it got us and, the traction. Right, exactly. <laughs> and and another, another benefit to working with a team that's not necessarily um, in-house is they have a lot of resources within their agency. So they might be, they might not know the answer to something, but you might be able to speak to their boss, right? So they're part of a, a network as opposed to the people who work in-house who, who might just have one another to rely on. And then when it comes to equity um, with a technical co-founder, it doesn't necessarily need to be like Danielle was saying, 50% or 40% or 30%. It can literally be anywhere from, I think it's two to 8%, two to 10% for a technical co-founder. And you're not giving it to them all upfront, right? You say you work for um, a year and you get 25% of it and then it continues to vest usually over four years. So they call it four year vesting with a one year cliff, right? Cause you don't get any of it until one year. So there's a way to set it up so that you're not just giving all your equity away up front and having a technical co-founder, especially if you're a solo founder, is probably not a bad idea. Would you agree? I think it's a great idea. And I also think that it's different from business to business, like how much equity they're going to get. If you're completely tech heavy, like if, if your primary product is tech, then the technical co-founder might get more than if your company requires the use of technology but involves social networks, for example, like ours. Okay, so then you get to step eight, right? So you got your MVP, you're ready to now get your first customers and users. So more times than not, you're probably going to start with things that don't scale. So, I mean... We started an app for singles. If you were us, what would you do to get your first few users on the app? And you could just shout it out. And I know you guys are all smart, so I know you guys would have ideas. 
tell your friends. Only your friends that are single or also your friends that are possibly married. Also your friends that are possibly married, right? Also no one mom, else needs to know that. <laughs> also your dad. Any, <laughs> telling everybody who can, a, anybody who can download an app is going to be the person that we share our idea with, right? So um, we had, we were 27 at the time. I was 27 at the time. And so we had all of our friends join. Um, and the beauty of a double dating app, we had our friends join with their partners and they were a co-ed team and whatever the case may be. So we had our friends, we had our family, we went to our personal social medias and we asked people, you know, please check out our app. We went to Penn State. We were in the same sorority. It's how we know each other. We went back into our emails. We found the listserv from when we were in college. We emailed the listserv, Griggs and Dietzik really need your help. We literally got as scrappy as we could get. So when you first start out with your first few customers and users, you're going to have to do things that most likely will not scale. We didn't have money. We couldn't just pay somebody who's an influencer to make a post for us. We could, but that would have been the whole budget. And I think we all are probably on the same page that influencers aren't necessarily the most effective means of marketing. doesn't feel organic or, or authentic. Um, some really great advice we got early on from a mentor was to burn through our brain cells before burning through capital. So it's really easy to just have an idea and just say like, we'll just pay for that. But like I said, it could have been our whole budget. Um, and so every time we have an idea, we stop and we ask ourselves if there's a way for us to do it that's possibly a little bit more cost effective, a little scrappier, um, especially now still being in the beginning, early stages of our business. So. Uh, I would say think before you spend and remember that your goal is to find product market fit. So product market fit means that you have a product that has a significant user base or customer base that if your product were to come out of the market, a significant number of people would feel it and they'd be upset by it. So I don't know if anyone else in this room uses Spotify or has ever, right? I'm getting some nods. Like we would be devastated if Spotify went away, right? Um, but it's important to remember that product market fit does not happen right away. Um, we are at the point now where we have an early stage VC who, um, invested in our company and she told me, you guys don't have product market fit. And we had at that time over 10,000 people in New York on the app because there are millions of people in New York and to have 10,000 of them doesn't mean you found product market fit. So it's a long, arduous journey. It's not overnight but your goal is to continue to, is to work until you find product market fit. Questions so far? We're doing a lot of talking. Yeah. Okay, we can wait till the end. So this is not gonna be relevant to everyone in the room, so I don't wanna spend too much time on it, but to those that it is relevant to, it's super important. So has anyone heard of the cold start problem, either the concept of it or read the book by any chance? Okay, so the cold start problem um, is a book that describes network effects. And the cold start is essentially what happens when you rely on network effects and you just start your business. So on a dating app, for example, you, the first users are going to have not a great experience, right? Because other people aren't on the app yet. But they're not going to recruit their friends to come to the app yet because there's nobody there. And they might actually now delete it and not come back. So it's really important to get over that hump, to get over that cold start as fast as you can, and to reach what's called an atomic network. So an atomic network is a single self-sustaining network. So any ideas as to, with a dating app, what that magic number would be, an atomic network would have X number of users in it. You can just shout it out. Two, Two million. million. Any other guesses? Wow, I hope not. <laughs> I mean, 2 million is, I mean, it's a legitimate answer because I think at 2 million, probably Bumble, Hinge, Tinder, they're never getting the, hey, I ran out of people to swipe on. Yeah, I think, I think definitely 2 million is 
that number where you're like, okay, we can sit back and relax. You have product market fit. <laughs> you yeah. brought it. But what we're talking about is on a much smaller scale, when you stop having users, like Julie said, say there's nobody on this app, when they start actually coming back for that second time or that third time. Do you want to guess how many we had when that started? Yeah. 100,000. Good guess. Yep. 200. Okay. 10,000. So what you have to take into consideration, and by the way, for us, it was somewhere between three and 5,000 in New York. So what you have to take into consideration is that with the dating app, people have preferences. So maybe 200 if everybody was all interested in one another. But then when people start having preferences and then they're also paired with a friend who also has preferences, um, that number increases tenfold. So for us, it was around three to 5,000. And there are many, many examples throughout the history of startups that have experienced the cold start problem. And so if you're building in the, in the space where it's consumer social or consumer, where it relies on network effects, this is something you wanna consider. Something we can take a stab at together is Uber and how Uber had this challenge immensely. Anybody have any idea as to why this would have been a particularly cold start for Uber? Right. I was asked to repeat everything said by you into the microphone so that people that are virtual could hear. So you said not only do you need people to ride, but you also need people to drive, right? So that's exactly why. So they needed people to be riders, but people don't want to be riders if they can't get a ride, if they have to wait for a ride. So simultaneously, they needed to get people to be drivers, but people don't want to drive if there aren't enough riders and they're going to be sitting in their car, not making any business, waiting for, waiting for pickups. So they needed to simultaneously grow the driver user base and the rider user base. And there are many other examples like that. And so if you think that you might fall into that category with your idea, um, that's something that we have a lot of experience with and we'd be happy to chat with you about. Any questions? Yeah. So how do you bridge the cold start? Do you have an answer for that? You just keep going. You just keep going, <laughs> but you can't do it too fast in every instance. So on foreplay, for example, we, what we were seeing was that the earliest user base was heterosexual women. And so we actually got a little bit worried because if we grew that too fast and we didn't grow the, their counterpart that they were looking to date, that that would be a problem and then they would delete. So for us, that was a unique problem. For Uber, same thing. If they, if they have too many people who want to be riders and not enough drivers, they have to do it at the same time, right? So it's really important to be slow and steady with all of the people, all of the different types of populations that want to interact with one another. And there's no fast or easy way to do it. Um, it is solving the cold start, which is a, a really difficult problem. That's why you need to have a strong product that actually solves a problem for people. Because if it doesn't, they're going to go on foreplay. They're going to be like, there's no one on. Well, back in the day, they'd go on. There's no one on here. I'm not coming back. Right. And then you lose, you lose the user. So I think having a strong product is part of it. And honestly, having good customer service. We get complimented all the time by our users on how good we are at communicating with them because I think part of it comes from the fact that we're healthcare providers and a big part of being a healthcare provider is sitting bedside with patients and listening to them and making them feel heard and not judged. And so that has definitely transcended into the uh, dating industry and being a startup founder. But when users would write to us saying, there's no one on here, but I love your idea, 
acknowledging it, being like, we know we're working really hard. We also want this to be a big success for you. We want you to be able to enjoy dating and just bear with us because we're working to get you more people. So also just being a human about it and not trying to say the right thing necessarily, I think also helped us solve the cold star problem. Um, but it, it took a long time. It took a year probably to solve the cold star problem. Um, so something I will add that's a little bit more concrete is referrals and word of mouth. So if you have a cold start problem with your particular idea, all of your marketing efforts should always have a focus of a legacy. It's not just going to exist in that one direct channel that you market to a certain person, but you want to make sure that it goes on beyond that if you're building a social network. So for example, if we are going to sponsor a TikTok, we want to make that TikTok taggable. We want to make sure that not only does it reach all of the viewers who initially go to that person's audience, but we also want it to reach their friends. So can there be a specific call out in the video that's like tag the friend you would double date with? Or can it be so compelling because there's footage of a double date that they're going to tag a friend or send it to a friend? So you wanna think about the, the legacy and, and not just the initial point of contact. Other things that we did that we learned from our New York launch that are now affecting our future launches is creating a, building a wait list um, before you launch. So we're going to Boston next. And we now are in a position to say, we have this many users in New York. We're coming to Boston next. Um, you can get in early now and we're launching on this date. So they're joining the app and they aren't disappointed by it. They don't think no one's on it. They know we haven't actually launched there yet. So I think wait lists is another way that people also solve the cold start problem. Um, targeting a specific, so specifically for a social network and a dating, network high being hyper focused in one geographical area right it wasn't cool when people from all over the country it was cool that they were like hey i'm on your app but it wasn't a good feeling to have to tell them we haven't really launched there yet and there's really no one else on the app for you and there's not going to be for a long time so being hyper focused on one specific target audience our pitch deck used to say our target audience are young singles and the same mentor who told us to burn through brain cells said okay no who is your target audience? Who are you target? Like, who are you targeting right now? So it was, okay, they're singles. They're in New York. They're mostly 22 to 29. They're mostly heterosexual because that's who naturally gravitated at first. Like it was getting extremely, extremely specific. So I think really honing in on your initial target audience also helps with the um, cold star problem. Any other questions? Yeah. How did we choose New York? We chose New York because with the cold start problem, that was particularly well relevant. So we initially just launched all over the world. We were like, okay, just, just release it in the app store and see what happens. And we had users all over the world, but they were really disjointed. So there were users like in every continent minus Antarctica. And we realized that it was really awesome, but that they weren't necessarily having a good experience because they couldn't see one another. And so we looked at where was the place that had the most number of users. And to solve the cold start problem, we should take all of our resources and put it just into that place so that all of those people have, at least those people have a good experience. So that's how we chose New York. There were the most users there. Also, we live in New York. So it, it worked nicely that we were on the ground and being able to do some scrappy guerrilla marketing there. Any other questions? Yeah. How has our target market shifted? It's a good question. So we launched in New York and then we decided our next launch was gonna be Penn State because we went here, we love it here. The um, research showed that Gen Z was disproportionately negatively impacted by dating apps, specifically with body image, self-esteem, sexual health, and sexual uh, behaviors. And so we saw a huge need for Gen Z to have foreplay, pun intended. Um, <laughs> and 
we were like, okay, this is a good next market. Let's try it out. We've now launched in a major city. Let's now try on a college campus. And we learned that the problem solution doesn't resonate the same way with college students as it does with postgrads because our problem is that dating apps have ruined single life because they're lonely, they're done in isolation, they're physically and emotionally unsafe, can be unsafe. Um, and our solution is to make dating fun by allowing single friends to date together and take the pressure off. That resonates with postgrads who have been burned by dating apps. Doesn't necessarily resonate the same way with college students who aren't using dating apps to necessarily date seriously. I think from what we've gathered more or less College students are kind of using the dating app for a late night hookup to each his own, whatever. Not really going to happen with you and your friend and two other friends with foreplay. It's a bit of a different vibe. So we're not abandoning college campuses. I mean, we're still at Penn State. We see it as a different opportunity where when you're in college, you're not really necessarily seriously dating. When you get out of college, for us, when we did, dating was very intimidating because we were never taught how to do it. And it was kind of scary to go on our first few dates and we felt really awkward. And so we see foreplay as an opportunity to bridge that gap. So when you're in college, you can get your feet wet and start going out with your friend and two other singles and introduce yourself to dating culture so that when you're out of college, the one-on-one -on -one isn't as scary. Um, but we decided that our next market was going to be a major city again and not a university because our problem and solution really resonates in a different way with um, young professional singles out of college. So that is who we're hyper-focused on right now. But we definitely see a bimodal distribution with our user base. There are also people in their late 40s, 50s, and 60s who are either divorced or widowed or have never been married who never use a dating app because it was extremely intimidating to them and weird and are open to the idea of being able to go out with a friend. So eventually we will broaden our umbrella and we will capture those people. But for right now we're hyper, hyper focused on the young professionals. What a success. Oh, he wants to know first question. If we have found success using foreplay, what's your definition of success? <laughs> so it's funny that you ask that we no, we haven't found a significant other, but we definitely have found success. So our definition of success when it comes to foreplay definitely doesn't mean finding a significant other. It is open ended. It's what you want it to be. And there have been people who have found relationships from foreplay, which feels really good for us. But there are also people who have like networked or made new friends. We actually got an email from someone the other night saying, I want to do sponsored content for you. I love foreplay. And I, I went on a foreplay date and kissed the guy. So I was happy for her that that happened for her. So their success is having a good time on a date because that is really, really hard to come by in the, the post-grad world, especially. Investors like to ask us about if we've had success on with foreplay and our definition of success is very different because for dating apps that are all about finding a romantic partner success for them is finding a romantic partner like hinges tagline is literally designed to be deleted and for us like danielle was saying that's not necessarily our definition of success but we've definitely su had success i mean we've dated people that we've met on foreplay for several months that just didn't work out we had one of our foreplay dates screen our now VP of engineering in the third interview because he was he's a CTO and a founder himself. And I was like, I, didn't, I need to make sure I'm not getting catfished. Like, is Danny actually able to code the way that we need him to? Um, we have friends that we've made. So it's a, it's a different kind of experience. You had another question? So the question is that we said that you should both get your MVP out as quickly as possible, but also bootstrap for as long as you can. And what, what do you do in that situation if you don't necessarily have the capital? Let's just hold off for one second because I'll talk about some options for you, but, but that's a really good question.
So he wants to know, so initially we used social media in order to get our initial target audience and, and to reach people and overcome the start pro- the cold start problem. But when did we know when we needed to pivot or our audience wasn't necessarily the right audience? Is that, is that your question? So it, it means looking at the numbers and analyzing the profiles, not dating profile, but like personal profile of every single user on the app as often as possible. Checking in, Julie actually would make, in in the very beginning, she would make these presentations where it broke down. This week, we spent this much money on TikTok. We got this many users who are in Manhattan who are men between this age and that age. This many who are in Brooklyn who are men between this age and that. So we would go through all of the users and we would see if we were getting a good return on the money that we spend. And so in the beginning, we were really just uh, focusing on data. And it's really important to, to look at data and not use personal app because we really wanted our app to be for people our age. We, we made the app for people our age. We wanted to use the app. And while there are a large number of users who are our age, the significant number of users come from the 22 to 26 age range. And we're older than that. Shocking, I'm not 26 right now. <laughs> Um, okay. We have a few more, I think we have like 15 minutes. So 10 minutes. Um, okay. You're up for step nine. Step nine is to revisit step five and to revisit any of the steps actually. So remember that step five is to know your goals and to know your life goals. So reassess, um, do we still want to keep bootstrapping? Do we want to start raising capital now? Um, Do we still want to IPO or would we rather have an acquisition? Stuff like that. Um, And and this this changes all the time. It changed for us, that's for sure. And then step 10 is the most important step. So you got to tune out the noise. LinkedIn, social media, everybody's going to be talking about how wonderful their life is, how great their business is going, how much they've raised, how many, whatever the case may be. We're guilty of it too. It's noise. Tune it out. The startup journey is very, 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 very difficult. It was probably one of the hardest things we've ever done. And we worked through the front lines of a pandemic as healthcare providers. It is really tough. And it's very lonely, um, which everyone says, and people with co-founders say it. So I give a lot of credit to solo founders because it is a very lonely journey. And Danielle said something earlier, which I totally agree with. The majority of your day and journey more feels like a loss than a win. And when you get those small wins, you really have to celebrate them because they feel really good. Because a lot of your day is being told no, or it's not feasible, or you're going to fail, or your competitor just raised this much money. You don't really know what goes on behind the scenes. We launched Foreplay. Literally two months later, we found out another company was coming out that was a very, very, very similar concept. That was venture back. So they had venture capital money. They hadn't even launched. They hadn't have a product yet. And we were already in market. And we were like, well, that sucks. They shifted. They're out of business. We had another company that was a direct competitor. They were funded. They're out of business. So... You have to just tune out the noise. You have to stay focused on what your goals are. Don't lose sight of who you are as a person. Don't compromise your values. It's the most important step, I think. So everything um, about your life and your goals and whatever is going to influence and you know change the direction of your life and your company. Um, so I don't have we don't have the answer for what you should do after these ten steps, but there are some other things that we can tell you about. So options for you and your startup. And this kind of touches on what you had asked before. So there are things called accelerator programs. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. They're kind of like universities where they are ranked and you have the top ones like Y Combinator, Techstars, but everyone really says Y Combinator. And basically what you do is you apply with your idea. And if you're accepted, they give you an investment, usually around like a hundred to $200,000. And they in return take about 7%, 5 to 7% of your company in common stock. And then you go through a cohort of other startups and their goal is to accelerate your business 
so that when you're finished with the program in like three to five months, you get put in front of their investor network on demo day and you pitch your idea and you hope to get an invest. Um, that's an option. We didn't want to do that. Um, we actually, we applied for Y Combinator and they told us that we were in the top 10% and to uh, reapply and we keep getting those emails every year, but we're not interested anymore because we are, we believe we're further along than that. Um, but those also require you to go full time. And so we were not ready to be full time. We dropped out of the interview process for an accelerator program because the pandemic had hit and we knew that we couldn't leave healthcare. So that's an option for you. Um, is to join an accelerator program. You're basically, it's like going to Penn State. You're in the cult. They, you look out for your own. Everyone wants to help you. You're an alum of that accelerator program. It's very similar to that. Alternatively, you can decide to raise from angel investors. So these people are investing their own money. It's usually, it could be as little as 5,000. It could be as high as $200,000 of very high net worth. Um, they make an angel investment from their you know, own savings or whatever the case may be, and they're an investor in your company, or you can raise from venture capitalists. So these are people that have LPs. So these are really high net worth individuals that invest into their fund. The venture capitalist then takes meetings with the businesses and decides where the fund should invest its money. And these venture capitalists have to report to their LPs who gave them their money. And so it's a very different dynamic having an, a venture capital invest in you than it is to have an angel investor invest in you. When we decided to raise funds, we did not want any venture capitalists. We didn't want that life. Venture capitalists want to have like a 10X, 20X return on their investment, which would mean that we would have to IPO, be in this for a very long time. And that's not necessarily what we wanted at the time. Um, we decided to take one early stage VC because they really resonate with who we are as people. And we share a lot of the same core values and principles and they're good people. And we know that there are people that we want to share our success with. So they're investors in our company, but everybody else is an angel investor. Um, we know that we're really fortunate that we were working as healthcare providers because we were able to go to work for 12 hours a day take, and then not have to work the next day and get the money that we got from working and put it into our um, company. Not everyone can do that. We recognize that we're really fortunate. A lot of people just keep their startup as a side gig and they continue to work full time until they have saved enough or have enough that they can pursue it. Um, there's actually someone that we had met who has a podcast. I'm going to tell him that I plugged him today. He has a podcast called Idea to Startup and he runs a program called Tacklebox Accelerator and it's for people who are not ready to quit their day jobs to pursue their startup full time and they need to get more uh, market validation. So resources like that, I would also recommend, um, you know, if you're not in a position yet to, to go full time because you don't have the capital. Um, you can, yeah, you can ask a question. So big, big, big principle is don't be afraid to ask. Everybody in the startup world asks for favors and that's because the startup world is full of the pay it forward mentality where you ask for favors because you know somebody will ask you for a favor and that you'll help them so it's really hard when you're somebody like me or julie who doesn't like to ask for favors and then you start crowdfunding right one of our campaigns was crowdfund one of our fundraisers was crowdfunding but what we realized, sorry, you should talk about crowdfunding because that's another answer to his question. Yeah, crowdfunding is amazing. Um, I, don't, I don't remember who asked that, but crowdfunding is, oh yeah. <laughs> so crowdfunding is asking your network um, if they will help you. And with crowdfunding, there is usually some sort of, like every site has their own catch. Like people get their money back if, if you don't f meet your goal, right? We use something that was called iFundWomen. And with iFundWomen, the way that it works is people get a reward for their contribution. And we set what those rewards are and what those, what those tiers are. And so if you have something that's a physical product, maybe you give the product. If you have something that's not a physical product, like us, you have to be creative. We said, if you give us $100, we will write you a song. And we wrote songs and 
posted them on Instagram. It was so beyond embarrassing, but people loved it. And then other people started giving us $100. And then we were like full-time songwriters. But we also had Julie would help you fix your resume or we would do a singing telegram. So that was a great way for us to raise money. We raised $10,000 that way. And give away no equity. And give away no equity. And what you really give away is your time. So you have to kind of think of ways that you could give something that's not too time consuming. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, that's okay. So don't be afraid to ask for help, which is why it's so cringy, but we're going to ask for your help. So we have this QR code. So we're in a competition. (laughs) (laughs) So we're in a competition and uh, the prize is a $500,000 investment. So your very own Penn State company um, could have this huge win and we are asking for you to vote for us, but it does require downloading downloading an app. So thank you so much if you're okay with doing that. Um, What you have to do is download Sweater, sign up, and then find the Barn Burner competition, find Consumer Tech, and then vote for Foreplay. And that would mean so much. Thank you. Um, We're happy to answer questions while we still sit here. Yeah. All right. I have one remote question from Lawrence. Uh, He asked, what kind of tips can you offer for advertising on a budget? That's all you. So... Personally, I don't recommend using Instagram ads manager, like an actual Instagram campaign, nor do I recommend using a TikTok campaign, but it is specific to the person's business. So a lot of people who sell clothing, for example, say that it is really helpful for them. Um, It hasn't been great for us. I don't think that we get a good bang for our buck. For us, I think a really important way, a a really inexpensive way is, um, first of all, this might sound kind of crazy, but on social media, commenting on literally every single thing that exists. And if it means spending six hours on social media to comment on every single video that's in your niche, do it. Because if you can get visibility that way for free, um, people will click your handle, they're gonna check out your page, they're gonna check out your link in bio, and you didn't pay anything, you just got to enjoy TikTok all day, right? So that's a really inexpensive way. And then also coming up with a clever handle. For us, foreplay happens to just fall into our lap as a handle, so that's great clickbait. But for other people, they might wanna think of, you know, be creative with what your handle is and be super visible on social media. And to even hone in on that more, to be in the comment section of any video where your audience is. So I know that might sound like a crazy answer, but. Um, Also, if you're specifically talking about running ads and stuff on social media, I would say make sure you A-B test. So Danielle loved group dating. I liked double dating. We we struggled with, but does double date imply singles or is that couples? It's confusing. So we ran ads early on, like a hundred bucks behind each to which performed better with our target audience. And that's how we came to make future decisions about advertising. Um, and then specifically, there are a lot of benefits for startups. So I would look online and see if you can find companies that give discounts for startups or X amount of dollars free, TikTok does that with us, spend this, get that type thing. So there are a lot of benefits out there for startups if you look. We're getting the time the time symbol. Okay, one more question. Should we let, yeah, go ahead. The most successful ways that we got our 10,000 users was, it was TikTok and it was through user generated content. So we had no success with, we tried paying influencers and micro influencers to post about us. It didn't feel authentic or organic. It didn't resonate. And it was a one-off one-offs are not very fruitful. The user generated content. These are people that actually use our app. They're actually passionate about it. They can put up content about their foreplay date, their foreplay profile. They do it with their friend. And then other people see this 
and they think to themselves, I want to do that with my friend. And so they tag their friend in the comments or someone who's in a relationship sees it and thinks of their two single friends and says, at Juliet Danielle, you guys should try this. So for us, TikTok was huge um, because we had so many users who were passionate about helping to healthcare providers turn startup founders who had no money launch their business. We've had hundreds of users make TikToks and because they're regular people and not necessarily influencers, it's really affordable. So that has been a huge strategy. Thank you all so thank much. Thank you. You were all so great. You, you asked the best questions and thank you for voting for us and good luck.